As we dig into our sermon series on hardened hearts and how that looks in our lives, what it means to have a hardened heart, and, uh, and what our world looks like because of our hardened hearts, uh, we bring that song in, we incorporate that, because that's what the world's saying, that's what often, that's how we're feeling. Now sometimes we like to romanticize this hopelessness a little bit, so that way uh, we kind of can look at the world and, and bring pity upon ourselves, or bring sympathy upon ourselves. But oftentimes this song really is a confession. It really is the submission of acknowledging this is where we are. Our hearts are hardened. We have given up, we have given up trying to change. We have given up that things might ever be different. And we simply submit that this is where we are. Now what I love about this song the most is that at the very end, the writer is saying, look, this is how I'm going to be. He's saying it all the way through the song, but fine, eventually he says, this is how I'm going to be unless, unless you show me how to change. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know what the writer is actually writing, but when I hear that song, when I see those words, unless you show me how, something comes alive in me that says, Jesus this is how I am, this is who I am, I don't have a lot of hope for changing a lot of the things in my life unless you show me how. Brilliant words, unless you show me how. And so we come today with hardened hearts. Parts of our hearts are hardened. That's why these rocks are on the altars, because we know that within each one of us, there's some resistance, there's some areas that are closed off to anything that God's trying to do in our lives. So we've been talking a lot about what causes our hearts to be hard. What causes them to harden. Now we most think of this as uh, when my heart hardens, or parts of it, or, hearts, or heart, your hearts harden, oftentimes it's because of some hurt, or some sort of betrayal that we've experienced, or perhaps pain or loss in our lives. And so when we're hurt or when things are destroyed, then we harden our hearts and we say, I'm not going to get hurt again. And so I'm closed off in that area. We try to protect ourselves. But today we're going to be working on something a little bit different. Another reason that our hearts harden. Now this might come as a bit of a surprise or something that we might have to dig into a little bit more today, which we will. But oftentimes our hearts harden because we don't allow them to understand right and wrong. They're hardened because we have set our own path and want to choose exactly and only what we want. Our hearts are hardened because we have too much freedom to choose our own way, to choose our own path. This might sound a little bit uh, uh, surprising, but we're going to go there and, and look at this. But I want to share with you a little bit uh, about what's been going on for me personally and how this is speaking to me today. So uh, yesterday, we had about 35, 40 people from Horizons show up at my apartment yesterday and uh, with arms and ready and trucks and pickups. And so Sarah and I moved into our new house yesterday. Uh, it took us two hours to go from North Lincoln to uh, South Lincoln because we had so much help. Um, it's been beautiful. So we celebrate that, and we celebrate how Horizons continues to support each other. But in the midst of looking for a new house, uh, I would do this thing. I'd play this little game where, of course, you know, you can go on Zillow, you can go on a lot of the websites, and you can look at houses. You can walk through the whole house without even stepping foot in it, right? Um, but I like to play this little game where I would just pick a neighborhood and drive through it and see if I could scout out that one house that wasn't on the Internet and find that, that diamond in the rough, or that, that beauty, that gem. And so I would, uh, you know, maybe to and from something, I would pick a neighborhood and just start driving down. And uh, oftentimes my wife was with me, and uh, Sarah held this really important part when we were doing this together, because while I was driving around and swiveling my head back and forth, looking at different things, she was the one who would say, there's a car there. <laughs> Watch out for that tree. <laughs> and of course I would say, I know, I, I can drive, Sarah. Um, <laughs> but, but there were a couple times when Sarah wasn't with me. 
And uh, there was one time I found this, this really cool house. You know, it wasn't on this internet sites. And I, and I drove past it, and I, I almost missed it. And I, st- I slammed on the brakes. In the per- corner of my eye, I finally saw this house. And, uh, and before I knew it, I was like, oh, I've got to check that out. So I threw it in reverse. And as I'm throwing it in reverse, th- my wife's not in the car, right? And suddenly that voice comes on that says, watch out for cars behind you. <laughs> um, but it was too late. Because as that voice was becoming more uh, substantial in my mind, um, I realized that my car was no longer backing up because something had helped it stop. Uh, <laughs> so I looked at the situation, and as it turned out, um, I had kind of just snuggled mo- the back end of my car right up to another uh, vehicle's back end. And so I got out and I looked at the situation. I pulled away, you know, and, and looked, and I was like, okay, well, from here, I can't really see anything. It's not until I get right here that I can see it. You know, that happens all the time, right? You go to the store, that happens all the time. So this is your pastor's confession this morning, and I'm just hang with me here. Um, I looked at my car, and I was like, you know, it's not really bad enough to fix. Got in my car. And I said, I wonder what other houses are in this area. <laughs> I drove away. And I was, uh, you know, actually I was okay with that, really okay with that at first. And then I got about halfway around the block. And just this voice, of course, this voice, because God's with us. And that voice saying, you can't do that. You can not do that. And then all the thoughts are running through my mind, like, I'm, you know, we're saving to buy a new house. I, you know, what am I going to do? Go home and tell my wife, you know, we're going to have to put this thing off a week or a month or half a year because I just ran into someone's car. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, there was no, no neighbors around. Nobody saw it. Uh, no one came running out to tackle me in my vehicle. Uh, but that voice was just so convicting, of course, and thank God that it was. You cannot do that. So, of course, I, uh, I pulled around the block, I parked my car, got a note out, wrote my phone number, wrote my email address, and um, firmly stuck it in the driver's uh, window there in, in the door and, um, and, you know, made that connection, you know, saying, I'm really sorry, um, I'll, whatever, you know, let's talk and I'll help you fix, get your car fixed. That was one of the hardest things to do because my way, my desires, my plan for my life had nothing to do with helping someone else fix their car, whether I damaged it or not. There was not an inkling in my life that had a desire to suddenly just hand, walk up to someone and hand them 500 bucks to give to them to help them fix their car. But see, what happens is we know that there's this, that there's this thing that says, uh, that God is wanting us to do, to really care for our neighbors, to reach out for our neighbors, and, and, and to be a presence of love, and a presence of sacrifice, and a presence of caring about others just as much or even more than ourselves. That's what God is giving for us daily, is exactly that, and that's what God wants for us in our lives. And yet we can see how conflicting that is in our lives when it matches up, when it's juxtaposed to the things that we want, to the trajectory of our lives. And in the midst of that, our hearts harden. Because the desires of our hearts don't always match up with the desires of God's will for us and God's way and God's love. The desires of our hearts will often conflict with what God is doing in the world, in our lives. So we have all sorts of our own ways, there are our own desires of our hearts, whether it be the job that we are just pouring our hearts into, or a, a career. Or, you know, uh, I have obsessed over getting a new phone before, and I know how much of my attention and my heart it sounds silly, but how much that can occupy. Or some other great accomplishment in our lives that we really want and we're working for. I know what that does to our hearts and our connection to God. 
It might even be as simple as a, as, a, as a minor fascination or a collection or a hobby that continues to, to gain our attention or entertain us in the ways that we are no longer uh, open to God. Or it might be a need that we believe will absolutely complete us if we can just satisfy that need. Or something that we believe that if this will just happen in my life, I will be fixed or everything will be better. And so we set our hearts on it. Oftentimes, our hearts get hardened because of the ways of our heart are set on addictions that run out of control. Pornography, alcohol, other drugs, sex, gambling, materialism, cool clothes, work. This is the way our world works. This is what we set our sights on. And yet, evil is slyer than we think, and it causes our hearts oftentimes to harden. When we set on our own ways, our hearts are no longer open to what God is doing. We become blinded, we become closed, especially if what God wants for us is in conflict with what we want for us. We become close to Jesus' Spirit working within us and guiding our lives uh, to Jesus' presence. Why did the Pharisees have such a hard time with Jesus? It wasn't because he had a cooler hairdo or it wasn't because he was, you know, uh, making fun of them. He was speaking a truth that was in conflict with what they valued. But this morning we look at how this is even just the beginning of what we're talking about. See, the first part of our hardened hearts is when we set our sights on something that we want more than our connection with God. And so our hearts begin to harden as we start shoving other things out of the way to make a pathway for this particular thing or this set of things that we want. But the second part of our hardened hearts comes then when we have laid this path and we've set our way. It's like, you know, playing dominoes and you've got a plan and you want to just lay them down and win the game. And uh, someone steps in and changes your plan. God steps in and says it's going to go a different way. Then our hearts get a second coat of hardening on them, a second coat of lacquer, because not only are they hardened so that way we can assure our path, but then they harden because we are resistant to to anyone interrupting that. And we say, don't you dare touch my plan. But I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians with me today. Chapter 4. 17 through 25. And if you didn't see the screen, I want to remind you that our, um, that our worship outlines are on the back of the program this morning. Excellent way to pl- uh, follow along and then also to dig in during the week and let this lesson continue to teach us and guide us along the way. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus. You know, Paul writes a lot of letters. That's why we have the four Gospels and then all these other, you know, hard to pronounce names following them. Is because Paul is prolific. He's trying to get the, the, all these churches that he's visited, he's trying to help them continue to grow. He's not there, but he's got this vision and he wants them to get it. And then he gets, catches news that they not only didn't get it, but then they went to the opposite. So he's, he's writing a line of letters. Chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians begins in verse 17 like this. My heading on the Common English Bible says the old and new life. So Paul says, verse 17, so I'm telling you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. He's so passionate here. He says, you shouldn't live your life like the Gentiles anymore. They base their lives on pointless thinking, and they they are in the dark in their reasoning. Now just hold with us on Paul's address to the Gentiles. We're going to look at that a little bit more. But look at what Paul is saying. They're in the dark in their reasoning. They are disconnected from God's life because of their ignorance and their closed hearts. Other translations will directly say because of their hardened hearts. Verse 19, they are people who lack all sense of right and wrong and who have turned themselves over to doing whatever feels good, and to practicing every sort of corruption along with greed. So first of all, who are the Gentiles here? Paul isn't 
putting a circle around himself and the other goodies and saying, hey, look at that group over there. We're in, they're out. Those are horrible people over there. What Paul is doing is he is referring to the Gentiles as the ones who are, because of uh, not growing up in a Jewish household, are farther away from God's teaching and this way of living. So Paul is less pointing out a particular group of people and is more uh, paying attention to people who uh, who haven't heard this or whose hearts are uh, simply closed to these things. So he's saying, don't live like the Gentiles anymore. Don't live like these people who haven't heard this good news anymore, which includes a lot of everyone. It doesn't matter who exactly it was in an ethnic setting. It was... Uh, it was people that were living in this way who seemed to lack all reasoning, lack an understanding of right or wrong, <laughs> lack that little voice in, your, in their head that says, you cannot drive away from that. You must, you must go talk to that person. Lacking right or wrong, verse 19, turn themselves into doing whatever feels good. Now, to whatever degree I know that we can all relate to that this morning. Paul says, don't live your life like that. Verse 20 says, but you didn't learn that sort of thing from Christ. Since you really listened to him and were taught the truth in Jesus, change the former way of life that is part of the person you once were, corrupted by deceitful desires, or the desires of our hearts that are only pointed towards what we want. Verse 23, instead, renew your thinking in your mind by the Spirit and clothe yourself with the new person created according to God's image in justice and true holiness. Paul's essentially saying, quit being disconnected or, 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 or and really soften your heart so that that connection can be reaffirmed between you and God. And he's saying, look, Jesus taught you something different. He didn't teach you to seek only after your own desires. He said, seek the kingdom first, and then all these things that you're worrying about, they're going to be added to you in the ways that they needed to be. Jesus says, clothe, your, clothe yourself. Clothe yourself in God's image. He's saying, you have the freedom and the power to be absolutely immersed in this instead. So in other words, if it, Paul is really talking about uh, this, this choice, either to live in this world where we continue to indulge ourselves and do whatever feels good and to, uh, and to have our hearts hardened towards anything else that might be disrupting it, or to move to a place where we are open to God's image of justice and true holiness, of God working and living and breathing in our lives. These are tough words, by the way. Paul's writing, and as Paul often does, he doesn't, um, he doesn't kind of read, he doesn't write a preamble or anything. He just kind of goes right to the core of something, and he says, boom, in your face like it or weep or, you know, do whatever you need to do. Uh, and, and so as we're reading this this morning, I want to acknowledge that probably uh, it's likely that many of our hearts are hardening right now. We're hearing this and we're like, wow, this is tough. I'm not sure if I really like this. Our hearts might be freezing over right now. We all know and Sarah knows better than anyone else that my personal weakness is that I can't stand being corrected can't stand it. I mean, I'm, this is confession morning, apparently. Uh, uh, Sarah's actually still at the house, you know, trying to find, uh, like, clothes to wear and things like that, because it's, it's just a mess in the house right now. But, uh, but it, she knows this more than anyone else. If I say, a, if I use a word poorly, she will look at me and say, I don't think that's the right word. And instead of me being like, you're right, that was funny. Like, I am infuriated. My face turns a certain color of red, and I'm just, I'm embarrassed. I feel foolish. I, I'm, I'm irritated because, you know, I'm, I made a mistake, or, uh, or it might be something else. You know, just making a confusion about something, or, uh, or just having the facts incorrect. I can't stand it. 
or if I have the right idea and it turns out to be wrong, I hate being corrected. But Paul mentions something in the very last verse, 24, and he says, uh, instead clothe yourself in God's image of justice and true holiness. Putting on clothing, letting this be what people see of you and know of you. What does that mean? It's a lot different than getting really angry or, uh, or defensive when someone corrects you. Luckily, the writer of Hebrews, writing to the Hebrew communi- community, and I invite you to turn to 12, verse 5 through 11, if you want to continue to follow along. Luckily, the, the writer of Hebrews, who we can't exactly identify, um, wanted to unpack a lot of what Paul was saying. And so, as Paul's mentioning these things about uh, clothing yourself with justice and and God's holiness, uh, this writer knew that the Hebrews weren't going to get it. Like, the the Hebrew community, they weren't going to get it unless they were able to hear a little something else uh, or to have it unpacked a little bit. So, in chapter 12, there's this brilliant, brilliant unpacking of what's going on here. And we're going to start halfway through verse 5, so you don't think I'm uh, suddenly somewhere else. And he writes this, quoting, he says, My child... Don't make light of the Lord's discipline. So we're using the D word here, and uh, uh, you know it's, it's really, it really kind of hurts our ears to hear, but he's talking about discipline. Don't make light of it, or give up when you are corrected by him because the Lord disciplines whomever he loves. Now, that doesn't sound right. I thought if someone loved us, they let us do whatever we want, right? And it, it, so he continues, he says, he punishes every son or daughter whom he accepts. That's drastically different from the world that we live in. Verse 7, bear hardship for the sake of discipline. God is treating you like sons and daughters. What an honor to be called truly a son and daughter of of our Lord. And yet, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense compared to the world that we live in. The writer continues, what child isn't disciplined by his or her father? But if you don't experience discipline, which happens to all children, then you are illegitimate and not real sons and daughters. Now, this writer picked up a couple things from Paul and just lays it right out there again. Verse 9, what's more, we had human parents who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? Our human parents disciplined us for a little while as it seemed best to them, but God does it for our benefit that we can share his holiness. Again, what an honor to be able to share in God's holiness. No discipline. I love this part. This is insightful and it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us connect here. Verse 11, no discipline is fun while it lasts, but it seems painful at the time. It's never going to be fun while it lasts. It seems painful. Later, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. It yields the peace of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So we're talking about the D word this morning, discipline. None of us like discipline, but oftentimes it's because we think that discipline is just something that people use to make us feel bad, to correct us from doing it again, right? Like uh, embarrass us or correct us in front of a whole bunch of people, um, make us feel bad. That's why we oftentimes don't like discipline, but often really in the truth of discipline is that it's just like when I was driving in my car and I got halfway around the block. Discipline is saying follow God's plan rather than your own. That's all it is. But we hate discipline so much because we don't want to follow anyone else's plan. We're human beings. We were given free will. We live in a free country. And so discipline hurts. We want our way. And discipline is saying choose a different way. After all, John quotes Jesus in chapter 14 saying, Jesus is he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Choose my way. And in that choosing, it's going to feel like there's a little bit of discipline. 
But the first step that we see in this, in this lesson of letting our hearts harden, of letting God chip away at the, at the iciness or the, or the stone that has enwrapped our hearts, first part is one, to loosen your grip on our self, self-fulfilling desires, to let go of them. It takes a lot of work to get there, but there's a beautiful day in store for each of us when we finally say, you know what, God, I'm actually cool with where you take me, and and nothing that I planned has looked the way that I wanted it to, but you're good, and what you have planned for me is good. Step two, accept God's discipline for us. It is God saying, I want you to choose a different way. It's like Miralax of the soul. It loosens, <laughs> it loosens our spirits up. It loosens our soul. It loosens our connection so that way we can actually reach out to God. Discipline is love. It is an honor for us to experience God's discipline because it is experiencing God's love. God's heart work working in our hearts is God's acceptance of us reaching out to us. That discipline, working on our hearts is what yields this. uh, Jonathan, last week, the intern, he did a uh, bang-up job yesterday, last week preaching on Romans. Uh, He mentioned the fruits of the Spirit. This discipline is what allows this fruit to begin to grow. Otherwise, it just stays dormant, nestled so deeply in our heart, we don't even know it's there. And so it's simple and good, right? Uh, you got the lesson, go home and just stop uh, being disobedient and welcome discipline into your life. Uh, it's not that easy, is it? Not so much. See, the author of Hebrews is talking about how uh, we were disciplined by our parents and we loved it. Wrong. Not in our day. What do most kids say as they're growing up? I'm never going to treat my kids like the way my parents treat me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said, anyhow. My parents are sitting in the front row. Luckily, they didn't give up on me. We don't like discipline. We don't honor discipline unless, unless we're discipline lovers and we can't get away from it. Um, but it's not so easy. See, oftentimes, we are, uh, we're afraid in our lives to be the discipliner because we don't want to be uncool. We don't want to be disliked. We don't want to seem like the bossy or controlling person. Uh, except for there is a small uh, group of us here who love controlling other people. You need to give that up. Your heart's hard. Okay? But most of us are in that place where we, uh, we don't want to be the bossy, controlling, uh, unfun person. And for the rest of us, we're also in that place where we don't like to be guided by others. We don't like to be told what to do, and so we're resistant to being guided. We're resistant to, be, to being controlled or feel like we're being controlled. Unless, of course, we're in that other really small group who uh, just loves people telling us what to do so we don't have to think for ourselves. Uh, your heart's hardened. Uh, open your heart. So we don't like discipline for those reasons. And oftentimes, we just want to make everything Okay. But we're reminded that in either of these situations uh, that, in, that God is bigger and working in more things than just the things that make us happy. The writer in Hebrews says, look, you're not going to like this, but it's going to be good in the end. We have to trust that God is bigger and working in bigger and, and more things than just the things that make us happy. And so I leave you with two classic lessons that uh, apply to us in real ways today. The first is that oftentimes this whole discipline thing applies to us in real ways because we don't know who we are until we know who we are not. And the only way we can begin to understand who we are not is when we listen to the one who created us and breathed into us our identity even though that way and that identity may be very different from what we think we need and want for ourselves. And the second is that it's difficult to stand for anything. And if we don't, excuse me, it's difficult to stand for things because when we don't stand for anything, we will fall for everything. And again, this discipline softens our heart and shows us what God has in store for us and what is good according to what God has instilled into the foundation of the earth. And so today I do invite each of us to let our hearts loosen its grip 
around our selfish desires, to let our hearts be softened by God's work, which coincidentally, discipline is also called mercy. God's mercy working in our hearts to soften them, to save us from going down that road that leads to a lot of destruction. Let's pray.